title of my thing uh, that we're about to see. It's called The Aesthetics of Atheism in a Divided World. Uh, David put me in the leaping over the walls category after we're done. I'm not sure if there will be any more walls. Uh, you, can, you can tell me. <clears throat> what exactly does the death of God sound like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Probably something like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Certain elements of the story may be somewhat apocryphal. But what isn't in question is that Ernest Rutherford's gold leaf experiment radically shifted humanity's understanding of material reality. Rutherford, known by some as the father of nuclear physics, designed an experiment in which he sent alpha particles through a few pieces of gold leaf. The result confirmed that atoms, and therefore all physical objects, are indeed comprised of mostly empty space. Legend has it that the following morning, Rutherford woke up and swung his feet over the side of his bed as he always did. But on this particular day, he found himself paralyzed with fear. He could not bring himself to set his feet upon the ground because he was convinced that he would simply fall through the floor. The image of, of Rutherford dangling his legs over the side of his bed, staring down at what he understood to be an infinite abyss of empty space beneath him, offers a kind of living metaphor for the existential state in which many contemporary people find themselves. Everyone may not articulate it in precisely this way, but it's increasingly the case that many feel deep within their lived experience a, a certain kind of angst and anxiety, driven by the fact that they can no longer trust the ground beneath their feet to hold them up. Their awareness of how the world is structured has so fundamentally shifted that when it comes to pressing questions about belief and non-belief, theism and atheism, it's as if they're sitting on their beds, feet hanging over the edge, and all they see before them is a vast and empty expanse. How did I get here? How did I get here? Is it real? Is it real? How did I get here? Is it real? Is it real? How did I get here? Is it real? Is it real? How did I get here? Is it real? One of the primary reasons for this kind of paralysis is that we too often think about theism and atheism as if they were located at the opposite ends of an infinite divide forever in conflict or in need of reconciliation. But it's not just ardent atheists who operate as if the opposition between theism and atheism is self-evident. A number of prominent Christian thinkers also suggest that contemporary atheism is in inherently incompatible with any sort of theism, especially Christianity. From this view, the choice is clear and simple. One must either reject atheism in favor of theism or vice versa, for nothing can bridge this divide. If only things were so straightforward and simple. You see, rather than a failure on the part of non-believers, what this atheistic impulse actually reveals is a, a lack or a malfunction within the Christian imagination. It signals a yearning within the human person that is for one reason or another not satisfied by traditional religious expressions. As a consequence, the way forward cannot be a matter of choosing between either atheism or theism. But neither is it to bring together both theism and atheism in, in a way that generates some kind of magical synthesis between the two. 
Both of these options simply reinforce the entrenched narratives of the divided world in which we live. The stories that separate us from the very neighbors we are called to love. Rather than either or, or both and, to get out of bed and actually walk upon the empty space below, one must navigate a much more daunting reality. Neither nor. Are you even here? Are you even here? Is everything going to be okay? Are you even here? Is everything going to be okay? Are you even here? Is everything going to be okay? Are you even here? Is everything going to be okay? Whether one identifies as a believer or a non-believer, there's an increasingly urgent need to move beyond the unhelpful and reductive categories that were handed to us, especially for all those who, despite their supposedly secular surroundings, continue to find themselves haunted by the perverse core of Christianity, which is exactly why when people of Christian faith choose to listen closely to contemporary atheism rather than hold it at arm's length, what comes into view is a much deeper and more textured reality lying just beneath the surface of the rigid and artificial binary of belief-unbelief. Namely, to engage the world theologically, much less Christianly, one must go through the atheistic experience. At least that's what Jesus' cry on the cross suggests. Indeed, it's not incidental that Jesus chose to quote Psalm 22 with his dying breath, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The gospel accounts provide both the Greek and Aramaic versions of his final words. The divine father, according to these texts, forsakes or abandons the son. But in the original Hebrew poem, the psalmist accuses God of something far more disturbing, apostasy. In this moment, a rupture of epic proportions occurs. God apostatizes against God's very self. Now, whether religious or not, few of us want to follow this line of thought where it truly leads, and for good reason. It's too radical. It doesn't really matter if one's context is bourgeois or bohemian, post-liberal or alt-right. This kind of divine atheism can only ever disrupt, unsettle, and disperse. Its critical edge cannot be softened. It can't be domesticated, nor can it be co-opted, for no one possesses it. It's why G.K. Chesterton suggested that there is, quote, only one religion, that is Christianity, in which God seemed for an instant to be an atheist. But just because something is unsettling doesn't mean that it's heretical. In fact, it's quite often the very opposite. Even though it's often upsetting for Christians to hear Nietzsche's proclamation that God is dead, God's abandonment of God on the cross is in fact the origin of the Christian faith. Needless to say, the further we go down this atheistic rabbit hole, the more any simple concept of God, theism, and atheism just falls apart. To be sure, the allure of oversimplification will always persist, but contemporary atheism resists such easy enticements. If anything, it moves in the opposite direction, toward rather than away from complexity. In so doing, it provides a unique lens by which to catch a glimpse, perhaps for the first time, of the scandalous heart of the Christian faith. So an aesthetics of atheism is an exploration of the dispositions and sentiments of a society moving increasingly toward a post-theistic future, toward a world of new gods and new ideas. It names an attempt to capture the mood, the spirit of the times, through an exploration of particular pieces of art, specific artists, and the shifting dynamics of religion in the 21st century. In this way, an aesthetics of atheism serves as both a site for theological exploration and an essential resource for articulating the Christian faith in a way that contemporary people might actually understand, a way that leaps over the walls that the modern world has erected. But even this claim masks one that is much more radical, the strong aesthetic vision that both animates and orients contemporary atheism actually opens a kernel of Christianity that is otherwise inaccessible. 
More so than anything else, it's the aesthetic shape of atheism that provides it with such profound religious insights. It's also both more and different than that, for the aesthetic vision of atheism actually creates the very conditions for faith, especially Christian faith. Consider again the tale of Ernest Rutherford and the plunge into chaos that threatened his existence that fateful morning. At first blush, it appears as if he was limited to one of two options. He could either ignore his newfound knowledge and step with naive certainty upon the firm and stable ground beneath him, or he could remain forever in his bed, paralyzed by the sheer terror of a world without any kind of meaningful substance. In fact, though, another option was available to him. It's one that admittedly requires a bit more imagination to see, an aesthetic sensibility, if you will. Rather than sit courageously on his bed or stand defiantly on the floor, Ernest Rutherford could have taken the more poetic route and danced on the edge of the abyss. If dancing seems like a counterintuitive response to an existential crisis of this or any other kind, that's because it is. But for those seeking to establish new coordinates in the wake of the death of God, it may be the only way forward. This isn't about exerting one's will to power over a cold and meaningless universe. It's about giving meaning to form. For within the ever-emerging context of contemporary Western culture, the dawning of each day presents a new set of difficulties that were literally inconceivable just moments before. So much is changing at such increasingly rapid rates that, in certain respects, change itself has changed. The religious landscape that was once imagined as timeless, fixed, and permanent has undergone a radical upheaval. As a consequence, when it comes to explorations of belief and unbelief, theism and atheism, faith and doubt, the only thing of which anyone can be sure today is that the once stable ground of certainty has given way and revealed a gaping chasm. Needless to say, there's no going back to a time when things were more steady and sure, but it also won't do any good to stay in bed forever. So we might as well get up and dance. The Illumin Playback Theater. Give them a hand one more time. These guys are great.